Well, it is uh, my joy to bring the word this morning. I look forward to uh, the day when my pastor and friend fills the pulpit again. Um, you know, le this last week, school started here in Santa Rosa County, and I've always been amazed by teachers. I don't know how they do what they do, uh, especially in the public school system. Uh, and uh, I'm especially impressed by uh, those that are believers that teach in the public school system. And I had the chance to talk to one young lady who, who does just that. And, uh, and she was relaying how difficult it can be just with children that misbehave and they don't listen and they act up. And, and, and I asked her, how are you able to, to do that? How are you able to to maintain your calm? How are you able to teach and to actually convey information? And, and she said, it's all about scripture. She said, scripture is what helps me. And I said, well, what, what do you, I mean, do you just recite it in your mind? She goes, oh yeah, absolutely. And I've got a, a favorite one that helps me. And it's, uh, it's Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, do not murder. And she said, <laughs> She said that by far is the thing that helps her get through her day. It's this reminder that these children under her care, she is not allowed to murder. Okay. Well, we're going to be looking in our continuing series on the Ten Commandments at the Sixth Commandment. We're going to be looking at this commandment that says, do not murder. That is what we're going to study today. And What's interesting is the sixth commandment. I mean, you can turn there in Exodus to chapter 20, but I'm telling you, it just says do not murder. It's three words in the English. It's actually the shortest commandment uh, in, that we have in, in the original Hebrew. It's only two words. It's lo, which means no, and rasach, which means murder. No murder. Okay? Pretty simple. God was very straightforward with it no murder. But it, despite its length, its brevity, it is an unbelievably important commandment to you and I. And as he did with all of the commandments, Jesus fulfills this or perfects it in a way that takes it far beyond its surface level meaning of, of assault or, or killing with one's hands uh, or an implement. Um, to, to something much deeper, uh, taking it to really an issue of the heart. But after all, as we look at the commandments um, on a human level, what could be more horrible than the wanton or thoughtless uh, taking of another human life? Uh, the King James Version says, thou shalt not kill. Uh, that was later changed in the New King James and the ESV and, and most modern translations to thou shalt not murder. And regardless of which words you have, um, it still really doesn't convey uh, the complete meaning of the passage. This, this commandment means more than most people can imagine. And then there was a survey that was taken among uh, New Testament believers, and it said, it asked them, of all the commandments which one do you believe you've never broken or ever will break? And guess which one the vast majority of people said? Well, I've never killed anybody. So it's, uh, it's murder, and I don't plan on ever murdering anyone. Uh, and yet, if we look at the real meaning behind it, we're going to be unpacking it here uh, over the next uh, few minutes. Um, it is one. Uh, that uh, I would venture to say everyone in this room has broken at one time or another in their life. While this commandment seems like a piece of cake, like it's something that's really easy to obey in reality, it can be a real killer. Oh, come on! I should have... Sh Chris, I needed you up here on the drums. Okay? Yeah, the, the 8 o'clock crowd, that went over much better. So they're obviously a much smarter crowd. So... But the fact is, all of us have broken the sixth commandment. While we may not have uh, necessarily taken uh, a human life physically, we have, at least in the words of Christ, murdered someone in uh, our hearts. But before we really jump into uh, the text and the message this morning, let me clear up a couple of uh, really important aspects of this commandment. First of all, this commandment does not prohibit 
capital punishment. All right? It does not prohibit capital punishment. Exodus 21, 12, the very next chapter, we read that the man who sheds the blood of a man must be put to death by man. God is a God of logic. He is not a God who contradicts himself. Okay? Capital punishment is not against the law of God. Hence, it should not be against our law or our thinking. Naturally, capital punishment should be administered rarely and fairly. But it is not a breaking of the sixth commandment. Nor does this law prevent or prohibit defending one's self. Exodus 22 Verse 2, the very next chapter, Moses relays to the, uh, the, the Hebrews that a thief who is struck and dies while breaking into uh, uh, your home or property, if that person dies as a result of you protecting your family, your home, your property, or yourself, that does not constitute guilt. The breaking of the sixth commandment, okay? You know, Quakers are probably the Christians who, who believe most strongly uh, in not killing for any reason. And, the, and there was a Quaker who was very dedicated to this matter, and he heard a noise downstairs in his house, and he grabbed his shotgun, used for hunting only, went downstairs, and he caught a man in his kitchen breaking in to his home. And he said, Sir, I would not hurt thee for anything on earth, but I must warn thee that I'm about to shoot where thou art standing at this very moment. So it's not, I'm going to kill you. It's, I'm just going to point my gun in that spot and you just happen to be there. There's nothing wrong with defending ourselves. The Bible does not prohibit that. And then finally, the Bible does not prohibit war. Okay. We have a right and a responsibility to defend our country and our community against uh, invaders. We have a right to defend other democracies against godless totalitarian regimes. The Lord, it doesn't take a lot of reading in God's word to see where God sends nations to war very frequently. War is not prohibited. So we, we see all the things that the, the sixth commandment doesn't prohibit. Well, what does this commandment then actually teach? Ultimately, we are told not to murder because of the value God places on human life. We are told not to murder because of the value God places on human life. And that begins with the fact that God is the creator of human life. We're told not to, mute, to murder because God is the creator of human life. Why is he so concerned about it? He's concerned because God formed you and me differently than any other creature that he made. Humans are unique. We are unique because we are image bearers of the triune God. We are the only image bearers of the triune God. And because we are image bearers, every human being an image bearer of God. Wait a minute, we're an image bearer of God? We all look so different. We're image bearers of God in that we have a three-part nature. We have a body. We have a soul and we have a spirit. That's different from any other part of God's creation. We are unique in that aspect. And because we are unique in that aspect, we have value, intrinsic value. We are a treasure to God. We are valuable to him. And because a person is valuable to God, guess what? They need to be valuable to us as well. Uh, we are eternal. We are going to live somewhere forever. We are different from all non-human life. Well, let me ask you a question then. Why is human life so devalued then today? Why was it when, uh, when the, uh, the, the federal right for a woman to have an abortion, when that was overturned, why did people lose their minds that they no longer could kill a baby. Because ultimately that's what it was. The protests, the riots, the people going apoplectic over losing the right to kill a human being. How has life become so devalued? 
Well, I, I will tell you, it, it has happened because of uh, what I call uh, dev dev devolution. Devolution. What does that mean? What does devolution mean? It, it means that the authority for life has been transferred from God to man. It's no longer about the creator. It's about what is most important for man. And if man has nothing to answer for, if he has no one to answer to, guys, guess what? Our degenerate nature will take over. It'll be all about us and nothing about anyone else. It'll be self-serving. It will be selfish. And it will be non-God honoring. And that is where this idea of devolution has come from. We see experimentation with human tissue, the cloning of human beings. We see euthanasia. Did you see that Canada just passed this past week unlimited euthanasia? It used to be you had to be terminally ill. You had to have a note from a doctor that said you were terminally ill, no hope for recovery, and they would allow euthanasia. Now, go for it. Doesn't matter. What has happened? What has happened? Well, I will tell you what's happened. When you take God out of the equation, any depraved act is possible. And we're going to continue to see an, an increase as long as we think that man is the authority on issues of life and death. Well, how did this, this idea of devolution get a foothold? Well, it got a foothold because of evolution. If, if we teach our children, if we teach students that they are nothing more than, than some biological accident, that they're nothing more than an animal, guess how they're going to act? Just like animals. And yet, we as, as born-again believers need to be the ones telling people, you're not an animal. You're created in the image of God. That is how val valuable you are. You're, you're a treasure. You, you have intrinsic value. It's built in you simply because you are an image bearer of a creator God. There's no God in the mind and the, the heart of the, of the humanist. Evolution has made human life cheap. And you teach a man that he's nothing more than an animal, and he's going to act just like an animal. And yet, when we teach them that they're created in the image of God, when we understand that identity, we live differently. We live differently. We are of value because God created us. I want you to understand, animals have value for the same reason. God created them. Our environment has value for the same reason. God created it. But we have special value as human beings. Because God not only created us, but he created us as the only part of his creation bearing his image. But if we forget, or we forsake this truth, or we compromise on it, because that's where the church has a real problem. Is compromise. If we compromise on it, we're doomed to greater and greater devaluation of life. You know, we we have to be willing to acknowledge that 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 human life didn't begin as an accident. We have to be willing to take the abuse as a as a young earth creationist and say, you know what? I don't know how God did it. I don't know why he did it. But I don't believe in evolution. I believe the earth is about 7,000 years old. Six, 7,000 years old. I'm good with that. And you know what? I think God wants us to be good with that, which is why he didn't use a lot of the word to explain it to us. Just take it for what it is. I'm good with that. I, I didn't start out as some amoeba and then turn into a fish, and then turn into a monkey, and then all of a sudden say, you know what, I could really go for a Whataburger right now. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And guys, we have to be bold, lovingly bold 
in standing on the truth of the word because it makes a difference. It makes a difference in the lives of kids who are, who are wayward and trying to figure out life. We have to help them understand how much they are loved by God and what he calls them to do is the most excellent thing for them. I talked to a young man yesterday. He was telling me about his first couple days at school. He said, I said, how is it? I said, are you dealing with a lot of transgender issues and things like that? He goes, he said, we've had that for the past few years. The new thing is, though, there's kids that walk around with ears and tails. Now, see, we laugh because it's ridiculous, but that is what they identify as. They're called furries, and they identify as animals or cartoon characters. Or... Now, why didn't that happen when you and I were growing up? It didn't happen when you and I were growing up because it was still okay to say, um, are you out of your mind? No one does that. That's not real. God made you a boy. Let me help you be a boy who grows up into a man. We need loving boldness in the church. And guys... Being loving is not tolerating silliness or sin. It's, it's loving someone straight to hell is what it's doing. And we need to stop. Amen? You know, the, the, there was a poet that pointed out really the foolishness of, of evolution. Uh, he, was, he had a particular college professor who was, who was steeped in evolutionary thought. And he said... He, he wrote this poem. He says, I once was an amoeba in for a swim. Then I was a tadpole with my tail tucked in. Then I was a monkey in a banyan tree. Now I'm a professor with a PhD. <laughs> we have to be willing to confront that kind of lunacy. The kind of lunacy that, that says, I don't know what a woman is. Come on. I know what a woman is. I'm married to an amazing one. God created life. Humans are uniquely image bearers of God. And as such, God desires to have fellowship with us in this life and the next. And he has chosen you and I to be the ones to value human life the way he does in order to point that life to him. Because God is the one that created human life. Secondly, God expects us to be the ones to protect human life. He expects us to be the ones to protect human life. Uh, I, I don't believe you can fully understand human life unless you understand the sixth commandment. Thou shalt not murder. Now, as I was going over this, I came up with at least three ways that we can commit uh, this sin spoken of in this commandment. And I believe uh, in this room, every one of us is guilty of breaking this sin. Now, the first way that a person can, can uh, break the sixth commandment is murder with our hands. You can, by your hands or an implement held by your hands or with some sort of weapon, murder someone. This commandment tells us, that states clearly that we're not to physically take a person's life. Now, that means the unethical, unlawful, unbiblical, un are taking of a human life. The unethical, unlawful, unbiblical taking of human life. All murder is killing. Not all killing is murder. We have, have, as Christians need to be mature enough to understand that. And it doesn't take a lot of reading in God's word to see lawful, biblical killing. God God commanded that. That is not uh, what the commandment is talking about. It talks about the unlawful, unbiblical, unethical taking of a human life by hands. That, that means it prohibits infant, uh, infanticide. The taking of an unborn child's life or a child's life. Children need their lives protected because they're unable to protect themselves. 
I want you to understand, we rejoice in the fact that, uh, that Roe v. Wade was overturned. All that Supreme Court justice decision did, guys, was overturn the federal right to abortion and send it back to the states. That means Christians better be willing to step up in their states, in their voting, to ensure that that is never codified into state law. And this is where we can't compromise. Well, I just uh, stop. It's the taking of a life. And I don't buy into the, the garbage of, of all these people saying, well, now that this has been overturned, the church really needs to step up. The church has always stepped up. The church has always been there. We're here to help. We need to be the ones that ensure life is cherished, is, is sanctified from conception to death. Because the things that start in Europe then make it to the Europe, or European American Bridge, Canada, and then work their way into the U.S. Euthanasia is already legal in Europe. It's now legal in Canada. It's coming here. We need to be ready to fight that. So you can murder with your hands. Secondly, you can murder by proxy. You can murder by proxy. It's possible to kill a person by your lifestyle. Have you ever heard the, the term, they died of a broken heart? I never believed that term until I came into the ministry. And I've had moms and dads and spouses sit in my office and I've seen the hollow, distant look, the brokenness in their eyes. I believe by a child's wayward lifestyle, by a spouse's infidelity or uncaring lifestyle or their abuse, that you can murder someone through proxy. They don't, do, they, they don't do it by poison or any other kind of weapon. They do it by a rebellious life. Spouses do it. Children do it. There was one night two uh, sons came home after a night of partying very late and their dad was sitting in the living room and he had two pistols, one in each hand. And they were a little worried when they saw him and he called them over and he said, boys, I'm not going to hurt you, but I want uh, uh, you each to take one of these pistols and I want you to go upstairs and I want you to shoot your mom. And they said, dad, have you lost your mind? We've never hurt our mom, much less shoot her. And he said, that's not true because you're killing her slowly every single day by your rebellion. It would be better if you just put her out of her misery. Guys, we murder by proxy. And I will tell you, there's a child, there's a parent, there's a spouse in this room who could be right now slowly killing uh, the people you claim to love with the sinful and rebellious lifestyle that you're living. And if so, I firmly believe you're violating the sixth commandment. You're committing a form of murder. There's murder with our hands. There's murder by proxy. And there's also murder in disguise. This, this is murder that may never find expression in an actual act to kill someone. But it's murder just the same. It's murder by hate or bitterness or, or by speaking contemptuously of another God calls it murder. Look, turn to your Bibles with me to Matthew 15. Go to Matthew 15. Come on, I haven't asked you to turn a lot this morning. Go to Matthew 15. And look at verse 18. This is the Savior speaking. He says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulterers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Jesus comes and he says all of these things that come out of a person's heart. He doesn't say they go and murder someone. He says it's just a thought coming out of their heart. But it equates to murder and adultery or fornication.
A man is, is, is not a murderer because he kills. He kills because he's a murderer. It starts in the heart. There was a lady who went to the doctor and, and he, she'd not been feeling well. And he did some tests and he comes to her and he says, Ma'am, I've got some bad news. You have rabies. And she looked a little shocked, but she asked for a pad and a piece of paper and she started writing things down. He said, are you, are you writing notes to loved ones or, or, you know, notes for your last will and testament? She said, no, I'm, I'm making a list of people I want to bite. And some of us are like that. Some people carry around this, this hatred or this bitterness in their hearts. It can be towards a spouse or a child or a, 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 someone in the past. It may be for an entire race of people. It may be for someone who has hurt you in some way. It could just be bitterness for purely selfish reasons, but God calls it murder. Go to Matthew chapter 5. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives the Beatitudes. And then in, in verse 21, Matthew 5, verse 21, he says, he says this, you said, you, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Notice that. Is it, is it a sin to be angry at a brother? Nope. You just got to have a cause. There has to be a cause. Now, if you're angry at this brother without cause, then yeah, it is a sin. He goes on and says, and whoever says to his brother, racha, that Aramaic word that means empty-headed, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. God believes this to be so important that he tells you, don't come worship me with that heart. Go make it right, then come. If you've got something against your brother, you go fix that relationship because any worship that you bring to me with that kind of bitterness in your heart is a waste. Just leave it. Go make it right, then come. What does the sixth commandment mean? Jesus said that anger in the heart is murder in the eyes of our heart. 1 John 3.15 says, Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. If your heart is a headquarters for hate, then you are a murderer. You know, I've, I've known guys that, uh, that kid themselves. They, they'll, they'll tell you, you know what, I don't, I don't hate anybody. But if I ever start, I got a couple of guys already picked out. Well, guess what? You're already hating on them. You're already hating on them. Now, look, I, I'm not up here acting perfect. Who, who in this room at some point in your life has not had hate in your heart? I don't think there's anybody. I don't think there's any of us who, who haven't spoken bitterly of, of someone or to others or in a flash of, of anger wished somebody was dead. It's just a demonstration of how evil our hearts can be. But guys, understand God doesn't brush over that. He doesn't look at that and say, oh, that's okay, I understand. He points out again and again that the thoughts of our heart, the intentions of our heart are as bad as an actual act. You know, there's a story uh, uh, of a man. He was asked by his wife if he would remarry if she died. And he said, I, I, I don't know. Big mistake, first of all. You know. And he says, well, she asked him, well, if you did remarry, would you let your new wife wear my jewelry? And he said, oh, no, absolutely not. And then she asked, would, would you let her wear my clothes? No, no, no way. She, well, would you let her use my golf clubs? He goes, no, no, she's left-handed. So <laughs> now I will tell you, yeah, I think that guy was already in danger of being murdered. Um, but there are others that they carry around murder in their hearts every day. You know, I know, I know that story's a little joke, but 
there, there are people that want others out of the way so they can get on with their, their real life. That's a murder in your heart. So God is, is the one that is, is the creator of life. And he expects us to, to, to be the ones that preserve life. Well, how do we do that? Well, we do that by elevating the importance of human life, not diminishing it. Going against what society says. Not trampling on human life, but elevating it. Showing the world how important it is. I mean, I, I, I would debate anyone who says that, that human life is not diminished nowadays. nowadays. I, I can't think of a weekend in the past year when less than 30 people have been shot in Chicago. And what happens even to Christians is we become so desensitized to that sort of thing that we don't put faces to the gunshots. It's just a stat. It's just a gunshot wound. It's not a person with a family. It's not a person who's created in the image of God with intrinsic value. What, is, what does God think about all this? What does God think about this devaluation? What does God think about the, the position of human life, the elevation of it? We don't have to look any further than Calvary to see how important human life is to God. There, it was there at the cross that we see the Son of God dying for the sake of the entire human race. All life is important to God. You know, the Bible tells us not a single sparrow falls to the ground without God knowing it. Are we not more important than the sparrows? And, and of course we are. Jesus didn't come and die for sparrows. He came and died for you and me. How valuable is life? And, and for whatever reason, look, I can't, sometimes I, I am amazed at God's plan. I would not have done it this way. Understand, the world would be really messed up if I was in charge. But God has decided for some reason... To let you, and you, and you, and you, and me, and you, and you, be the ones to tell the world about him. What in the world? It's like he's never seen me. I look in the mirror and go, God, what are you thinking? And yet he has chosen his church, born again believers, confessors of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the ones to tell the world about him. So how do we do it? How do we then let the world know their value to God? We have to lovingly and boldly go out and tell them that you are not a product of evolution. You are not a descendant of a monkey. You are created in the image of God and you are loved beyond comprehension. And what God wants for you is the absolute best thing for you. Let him love you and let me tell you about him. As Miss Beck comes and takes her place, I want you to understand it is the church's responsibility to do God's work in this world. And as God seeks to elevate the value of human life, he is using you and I to be the ones to communicate it to the world. Look, could God come and speak audibly to the world? Human life is important to me. Yes, he could. But he's picked you and I to be the ones that do it. It's vitally important that we go out and let the world know how much they are loved. Now, here's the hard part. It's easy when they look like us. How bold are we going to be? How courageous, how willing are we going to be to go to the furry at Navarre High and tell them, you know what, buddy? You're created in God's image and God loves you more than you can fathom and he wants what is absolute best for you. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to go to the six foot four guy who decides he needs to start wearing sundresses? Are we going to go to him? And tell him, buddy, God loves you more than you can imagine. And he wants what is absolutely best for you. Let me tell you about him. Are we willing to do that? Or do they have to look like us? 
That's a tough one. That's a tough one because guess what? That six foot four guy in the sundress, he is absolutely loved by God. And God wants him to know him. And if he dies, God will mourn over his death. I love what Spurgeon said. People are going to go to hell. People will go to hell. But if they do go to hell, let them go to hell with our arms wrapped around their knees and let them never go unloved or unprayed for. Are we willing as a church, as a community, to do just that? To be used by God to point people to God by telling them how much they are loved and how valuable they are. We talked about this bitterness and this hate that we can hold in our hearts, possibly even for an entire race of people. Guess what? We can do it for homosexuals. We can do it for transgenders. We can do it for all the people whose sins we are just so disgusted by that we don't think they're worthy of hearing the gospel. They're the exact ones that Jesus died for. They're the exact ones. The sixth commandment, do not murder. No murder. We can do it with our hands, not very frequently. We can do it by proxy, yeah, by rebellious lifestyles. More often than not, we do it murder in disguise. We do it with bitterness. We do it with hate in our heart. And my Savior, the one that saved me and perfected all of these commands, tells me it's exactly the same.